Hello! So I want this channel to be about the history, science and technology of photography. And a key component of photography is light. Because without it, there would be no vision and of course no photography. So over the next few videos, we will talk about the history of our human understanding of the nature of light. It's a huge topic and I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. Which means that we'll skip over a lot of people and topics. But of course, if there's interest, then we can go deeper into individual topics in the future. Even though I want this to be a brief history of light, we're talking about roughly 2500 years. So I'm splitting it up into a few short videos. I should probably mention that we'll be talking about what happened in Europe and in the Near and Middle East. I know that there was some light-related research in other regions, such as China. For example, there's a philosopher called Mo Tsi who lived in the 4th century BCE. But I'm not really familiar with these other regions, so I can't really talk about them. So when we talk about the history of human theories of light, then we're limited to the part of history where we have written records. And, well, at least to the part of history to which written records refer. And while there were some lenses found that were dated to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, the first proper theories we have are from the ancient Greeks. Some of their theories may sound a bit bizarre to us today, but keep in mind that compared to the ancient Greeks, we today have benefited from another two to three thousand years of accumulated knowledge. From what I've read, human intelligence wasn't vastly different at the time. So it's not that people back then were stupid and couldn't do any better but they were very much at the start of a long process of gradual, incremental discovery, which still continues today. So imagine you live in Greece in the 6th century BCE. You don't know that the entire world, every object is made up of atomic and subatomic particles. You don't know that there are fields like the electromagnetic field all around us. You don't know about things like bacteria and viruses and so on. You live in a world that is ruled by the gods and other supernatural beings, and some of them are really powerful. Up to that point, physical phenomena were attributed to these supernatural forces. But then, some Greek philosophers started to look for alternative explanations. And they found lots of different explanations. I'll just pick out a few of them. So, the Greek theories were really about vision, but that also required some interpretation of light. For example, a common belief was that of the visual fire. In that belief, there is some form of, of fire in our eyes and it sends out rays or beams that effectively scan the world around us. And this beam doesn't scan the whole space at once, but it goes from spot to spot. So if we can't immediately see some fine detail, then that's because the beam didn't scan the particular spot where the detail is located. If we see more by looking more closely, then that's because the beam now covered that particular spot. Of course, if vision was just fire coming out of our eyes, then we'd probably be able to see at night. And different Greek philosophers provided different solutions to this issue. For example, Empedocles suggested that only the interaction of fire from the eye and fire from another source of light, like a flame or the sun, allows for vision. A theory like that, where something goes out of our eyes, is called an emission theory. Not all Greek theories were emission theories. For example, Epicurus suggested that there are very thin films of material coming off an object and going into our eyes. And these films maintain the shape of the object from which they came, and our eyes somehow process that shape. And the particles that left the object are immediately replaced by new ones, so the object doesn't get smaller. This kind of theory, where something from the outside enters our eyes, is called an intromission theory. So there were lots of different theories, and some of them suggest that there are tiny particles. But the Greeks didn't have the technology to test if that claim is actually true. So nobody knew that there were particles. It was one of many theories that could be correct or not. In fact, a common theme among ancient Greek philosophy and of many centuries afterwards is that their research 
didn't follow what today we call the scientific method. They didn't set up an hypothesis based on observations and then rigorously test it to see if it's consistent with all further observations. Rather, they assumed a certain view of the world and then drew inferences from their assumptions, but they didn't spend time to test and potentially reject their hypotheses. There is another important concept that was born during the time of the ancient Greeks, and that is the concept of the ether. What exactly the ether is depends on the philosopher or the theory, but it generally represents some medium that's all around us. And this medium, somehow, allows for the transmission of whatever it is that causes vision. As I said, the details depend on the specific theory. For example, Aristotle's theory included the ether, and in his theory, vision is only possible when the ether becomes transparent, which in his theory isn't always the case. And what we call light really is the state of the ether being transparent. Right? So in Aristotle's theory, light is not particles or rays or anything like that, it's the state of the ether. This concept of the ether may sound a bit strange to us today, but it was a central component of the major theories of light up to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And there was, there was still at least one experiment which tested for the existence of the ether in the 21st century. Also, Aristotle's theory was influential for a long time, probably up until the 17th century. After some time, there were also other, more mathematical approaches to vision and light. For example, Euclid, who is best known for his work on geometry, also wrote a book on optics. And in that book, he applied his geometry to vision. For example, this image shows his analysis of why an object is seen more clearly when it's closer than when it's further away. It's an interesting book, and it's not too difficult to read. I put the link to, the, to an English translation into the video description. This book is also interesting because it may be seen as the very first step in a branch of physics called geometrical optics. Like almost all theories, geometrical optics is a simplification of the real world. In that theory, light is modeled as rays that go in straight lines. And what light is actually made of, particles, waves, is not really important. It's an approximation, so it's not 100% accurate. But in many cases, it's good enough. For example, geometrical optics is still used today for designing optical instruments like lenses. We've spent a lot of time on the Greeks, and that's because their theories had a huge impact on the theories that came afterwards. But let's move on. Over the following centuries, research into light and vision and many other interesting topics continued. But how much research takes place is heavily affected by the social and political environment. In those times, there was no compulsory schooling and education varied a lot by class and even by family. In many places, even in many Greek states, slaves and also women, even free women, didn't, didn't receive any formal education. And even if you did, to be able to dedicate a large part of your time to research, you either needed to be wealthy or be supported by somebody like a wealthy patron. It also helps to have access to the theories of others and to live in a stable political environment and in a society that places a high value in knowledge and research. For example, ancient Rome was a large empire which was quite stable for centuries. There were lots of wealthy citizens and they did have access to Greek texts. In fact, after the Romans conquered Greece, many of the tutors of the children of the Roman upper class were Greek slaves. And upper class Romans usually spoke both Latin and Greek. But Roman society didn't put a very high value on scientific research. So in ancient Rome, there was less scientific output than in ancient Greece. Of course, there were people doing research. And um, there were a lot of improvements in matters that were of direct, practical concern. For example, in architecture and civil engineering, the development of arches and domes led to the construction of huge aqueducts, bathhouses, large-scale storage facilities, and of course there were lots of improvements in technology used for warfare. But there was no emphasis on fundamental research, like finding out more about the nature of light. Having said that, of course some people in the Roman Empire did work on optics, and the book called Optics by the Alexandrian researcher Ptolemy became very influential for centuries. 
So ancient Rome is one example where there wasn't a lot of focus on research. Let's move on to a very different example a few centuries later. We're now in the 8th century CE. The Roman Empire had split up into East and West centuries earlier and the Western Roman Empire had collapsed. The Eastern part, the Byzantine Empire as we call it today, still existed but had lost a lot of the former Roman territories. Also, Christianity had replaced most of the polytheistic religions that had previously existed in the Roman Empire. On the Arabian Peninsula, during the 7th century, Islam was founded and it spread rapidly across Arabia, parts of Asia and Africa. Initially, the Umayyad dynasty ruled the Islamic lands, but in the 8th century, the Abbasids overthrew them. And the Abbasids valued science very highly. Their rulers spent a lot of resources on acquiring and translating all the manuscripts they could obtain. They employed clever people to do research and they even set up research institutions. And not only did that effort save a lot of ancient manuscripts from being lost, but over time and based on all the knowledge collected from other civilizations, Muslim scholars did a lot of research themselves. And, quite importantly, Unlike in the Greek world, experiments were common during this Islamic golden age. There were a few scholars in the caliphate who dealt with light and vision. One famous researcher is Ibn Sina, who gave some generally convincing arguments that the emission theory of light, where the eye emits something that allows us to see, is wrong, and that the intromission theory, where something enters the eye, is right. However, the, for us, most relevant researcher is probably Ibn al haytham who lived in Cairo at around 1000 CE. And his approach to doing research is very much in line with the scientific method. In fact, his contributions to our understanding of light and vision are quite significant. We could probably spend a few videos just talking about his work. One of his important contributions is to suggest that vision is due to light that's reflected from all points of an object and which enters our eyes and is then processed by our brain. This is what happens, even if he wasn't perfectly accurate on the details. He also figured out that light travels at very high but finite speeds. He talked about how the reflect the, sorry, he talked about how the refraction of light is due to light traveling at different speeds in different media, um, and much more. So that happened during what's called the Islamic Golden Age, and it's generally said to end sometime in the 13th century. And during all of this time, very little scientific progress was made in Europe. And that's due to lots of reasons. For example, the stability of the Roman Empire was gone. And it took a while for new political entities to develop and to become stable. Plagues had dramatically reduced the population and cities became smaller, which reduced the possibility of getting good education. As a consequence, during the early Middle Ages, scientific inquiry moved mostly to monasteries, and their focus was generally on topics relevant to church matters. Another potential reason is that most research in ancient Greece and Rome had been done in Greek, which wasn't widely spoken anymore in the area that used to be the Western Roman Empire. But luckily, Arab manuscripts made it into Europe and were translated to Latin. So towards the middle of the High Middle Ages, Europeans had access to a lot of both ancient Greek texts that had been largely forgotten and Arab texts that had been written over the past centuries. And by that time, Western Europe had largely recovered and scientific inquiry started to pick up again. So I think that's a good place to stop for this video. We've already covered about 1,500 years, but there's a lot more to come. In the next video, we'll move on to what's sometimes called the scientific revolution which took place in the 16th and 17th centuries. As always, I'd really appreciate some feedback. And if you don't want to miss the next part, then consider subscribing. See you soon.